We're going to look at a special type of hyperbola. Probably what you originally thought all hyperbolas looked like, that being the rectangular hyperbola. And that's because the first one we ever see is that one over there, y equals 1 on x. That is an example of a rectangular hyperbola. Basically, a rectangular hyperbola is any hyperbola whose asymptotes are perpendicular. So let's say the classic one that we're used to seeing, well, the coordinate axes, they're at 90 degrees to each other. So that satisfies that definition of a rectangular hyperbola. So what does that mean? Well, if I multiply the two slopes together, I must get negative 1. So b on a times minus b on a is negative 1, which means b squared equals a squared. It means b equals a. So a rectangular hyperbola will have the equation x squared on a squared minus y squared on a squared is equal to 1. Or if we multiply by the a squared, x squared minus y squared equals a squared. So we can work out our eccentricity. a squared plus a squared on a squared. So every rectangular hyperbola has an eccentricity of the square root of 2. I've seen the question asked on more than one occasion where they've asked what is the eccentricity and people have just wasted time calculating it out. If you know it's a rectangular hyperbola, it's the square root of 2. The eccentricity of all rectangular hyperbolas are the square root of 2. So there it is. In all its glory, x squared minus y squared is equal to a squared. But I so say, we're used to seeing it look like y equals 1 on x. How do we turn this one, x squared minus y squared equals a squared, into that one, y equals 1 on x? And what we do is we rotate the whole shape 45 degrees. Because remember, at the moment, the equation of the asymptote is y equals x. And we said a equals b. So the asymptotes were b over ax, and now it's a over a. So it's simply y equals x. So we know they're at 45 degrees. I want it to become the y-axis. So if I could rotate the whole thing 45 degrees anti-clockwise, I would have it in the position that I'm used to seeing. Hmm. Rotating points in a number plane. If only there was something we've done in a number plane rotating points. Well, we have, but we didn't call it a number plane. Uh, yeah. If we now think of these as complex numbers, that point xy, I'm now going to think of as the complex number x plus iy. And I'm just going to rotate that complex number 45 degrees. So in other words, every single random point, I'm going to rotate 45 degrees. Well, we know in our Argand diagram, that means multiply by cis 45. Because we're rotating at 45 degrees, we're not changing the length of the vector. So it would be one lots of cis 45. So x plus iy times cos 45 plus i sine 45. And uh, they're both 1 on root 2. And, uh, well eventually expand out group real and imaginary there are the coordinates well sorry there's the complex number but we can read off that now and say oh well that's equivalent to the point with coordinates x minus y on root 2 plus x plus y on root 2. So I'll label it capital X so we don't get confused our our new x coordinate once I've rotated it and the little letters of the old x and y coordinates would be x minus y on root 2. The new y coordinate would be x plus y on root 2. What would the equation be? Well, if I multiply those two coordinates together, I'll get x squared minus y squared on 2. But we know x squared minus y squared, because it's a rectangular hyperbola, is equal to... And so there we get it. x, y is equal to a constant. And that's what we're used to seeing with our hyperbola. So x, y is equal to a constant, a squared on 2. So where does the focus go to? The focus was a e naught. Okay. Eccentricity is the square root of 2. Uh, again, if I multiply that particular point by 1 on root 2 plus 1 on root 2i, I end up with a plus a i. So the focus ends up being a a. Now the directrix. This one's going to be a little bit trickier, but here's how we're going to do it. At the moment, we know it's plus or minus a on e, but we know e is the square root of 2. 
So that's where it is originally. We're going to rotate this line 45 degrees. Originally, the directrices are parallel to the y-axis. If I'm rotating 45 degrees, then my new directrices will become parallel to y equals negative x. So I know the slope of the line I'm looking for. So it must be in the form, if I put it in general form, x plus y plus some constant number is equal to zero. Just got to work out that constant number. Okay, what else do I know? Well, I know the distance between the directrices is 2a on root 2. Now, when I rotate it, that's not going to change. Or another way of thinking about it, the distance from the origin to the directrix would just be 1a on root 2. Or another way of thinking about it, the perpendicular distance from the origin to the directrix. So when I rotate it, that perpendicular distance is still a on root 2. So the perpendicular distance to x plus y plus k has to be a on root 2. And look what happens. We just end up plus or minus a. k is plus or minus a. So there's our directrices. x plus y well, I put it as equal plus or minus a. Eh? If we've got a rectangular hyperbola and the asymptotes are our x and y axes, we know it has the equation x, y. We don't say equals a constant. We just say equals a half a squared. Because if we know what a is, a is a good number to know because the foci are going to be at plus or minus a, a. The directrices are going to be x plus y equals plus or minus a. So that's why it's good to think of the constant as a half a squared, because then we can work out what a is very quickly. Uh, eccentricity is always a square root of 2. The parametric coordinates, you'll notice now I've made an x, y equals c squared. Why do I do that? Because the parametrics become very easy then. I say, well, the x is ct and the y is c divided by t. So multiply them together, the t's cancel, you get c squared. So be careful on how you're thinking about it. Half a squared for the constant, if I want to work out the foci, the directrices. But if I'm playing with the parametrics, I make the constant c squared. The tangents, and well, I won't, I'm not going to bother to derive it, but you know, same way as we normally do, find the slope, sub in the point, point slope formula. We get x plus t squared y is equal to 2ct. And the normal, beautiful, isn't it? t cubed x minus ty is c outside of t to the 4 minus 1. You'll notice with this parametric, it's more like what we saw with the parabola, where rather than referring to the angle, we're just giving it a, a value of t, like we did in the parabola where we had 2at, at squared. Quarter contact. If I do it the way that we did it with the parabola, because the parametrics are similar to that, we'd find the equation of the chord pq, uh, it'll end up something like that, x plus pqy is equal to c outside of p plus q. Show that the point of intersection turns out to be that, 2c pq p, p on p plus q. In order to do that, of course, we'd have to find the equation of the tangent, solve the two tangents simultaneously. So x naught becomes 2c pq on p plus q, y naught 2c on p plus q, Substitute back into our equation up here. Because remember, we don't know what P and Q are. We know what X naught and Y naught are. And we have got rid of the PQs. I've still got some P plus Qs. But then I can use the Y naught to get rid of the P plus Qs. And eventually we end up with that expression. But again, have a look at it. And have a look at the equation of the actual hyperbola itself. The equation of the hyperbola was xy is equal to c squared. Again, if you forget the fact that the little zeros are there, what have you got there? You got 2xy equals 2c squared, xy equals c squared. So it still has that form of the actual hyperbola itself. All right, let's have a look at a question. The hyperbola h is xy equals 4. They were very nice. A gift question to start off with. Sketch H. She's got to draw a rectangular hyperbola. Where H intersects, showing where it intersects the axis of symmetry. 
By the way, it has two axes of symmetry, but I wouldn't be drawing in that one because it never intersects. We want that one. Y equals X is the axis of symmetry. And for this one, if I solve them simultaneously, I get X is plus or minus two. So two, two, and negative two, negative two is where they meet. Find the equation of a tangent. Okay. Well, do I dx minus four and x squared? Substituting my point, my slope is minus one on t squared. Point slope formula. Play around with it. And there we go. X plus t squared y is 4t. S doesn't equal zero. Well, that makes sense, because look at the coordinates of point Q. If S was equal to zero, the y value would be undefined. Uh, S squared does not equal t squared. There's probably a good reason for that. We'll find out, I'm sure. Uh, but we've got to show that those two tangents intersect at this particular point. So tangent at P, therefore tangent at Q, and the difference is S instead of T. Solve simultaneously. Uh, T squared minus S squared. Ah, that's why S squared can't equal T squared. Because if they did, I would now be dividing by zero, which of course I can't do. And so we end up with 4 on S plus T. Beautiful, that's what we want for the Y value. Now, because it says show that, I can't just go, oh, therefore X is this. Because they've given me that answer. How do they know I didn't just write it down? So I, I've got to show the substitution. So X plus 4T squared on S plus T is 4T. Playing around with that, there we go. I get my X value. Part D. Suppose that S is minus 1 on T. Show that the locus, so here's the good old locus questions. You've probably been wondering when we're going to get to these. Thought, because, hang on, locus, we haven't touched on it yet. It's a straight line through the origin, but not including the origin. So we now know S is equal to minus 1 on T. Remember, we found the coordinates of M. Well, if S equals minus 1 on T, another way of saying that is ST is negative 1. So my X coordinate is negative 4 on S plus T. Hang on, my Y coordinate is 4 on S plus T. Y is negative X. Uh, but it said not including the origin. Hmm. Why can't it include the origin? Look at Y, for instance. It's 4 on S plus T. That can never equal zero. So therefore, this line can't go through the origin. So Y equals negative X. However, 4 on S plus T can't equal zero. So therefore, the point can't equal zero, zero. So we have Y equals negative X, but excluding the origin. We don't have the origin. Okay. Now, a thing on locus. Syllabus is very specific on this. You will only be asked locus questions on the rectangular hyperbola. Now, the, uh, the other conics, you might be asked those geometric ones. You know, find this angle, show this is that. But when it comes to find the locus of a point... It has to be the rectangular hyperbola. Because that's what the syllabus says. Sometimes the question is this has 